Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. Podcaster Steve Guerra invited me on his show, Beyond the Big Screen, to discuss the movie Black Robe, set in New France in the year 1634. I hope you enjoy part two of this interview. I'm very happy to be joined again by Mark Vinette of the History of North America podcast. And today we are going to really take a deep dive on a kind of a unique movie, the 1991 movie, Black Robe, about the Jesuit who they call Black Robe. And that's where the name comes from of the movie. This movie really brings in a lot of interesting facets of the history of the church, Catholicism, Native Americans, and the colonization of North America. And the Jesuits, they were a monastic order who were missionaries, predominantly to contrast them with the mission system that the Spanish used in Texas and northern Mexico. The monastic orders that led that were the Franciscans and the Dominicans, so they're all Roman Catholics. But the Franciscans and the Dominicans used similar methods, but different methods. The French were primarily using the Jesuits to spread Christianity amongst the Native Americans. So that's where they give us some foreshadowing of what could happen to the Jesuit, who they call Black Robe, and that's where the name comes from of the movie. In France, where he meets the Jesuit priest in that scene in the cathedral, where the priest is, I believe his ear was gone and half of his face was scarred from burning and he was missing part of his hand. It was foreshadowed that and implied that that happened by the the Native uh, Americans to him. So the Jesuit priest, Black Robe, he knows he's in for it and that it's not going to be an easy walk in the park when he gets to New France. Oh, definitely. Most Algonquin Huron settlements lived by hunting and fishing, and Catholic Jesuit priests from France lived amongst them. The nations of the Iroquois Confederacy considered the Jesuits legitimate targets of their raids and warfare, as the missionaries were nominally allies of the Huron and French fur traders. Retaliating for French colonial attacks against the Iroquois was also a reason for their raids against the Huron and Jesuits. We cannot minimize, Steve, the importance of religion in the 17th century. One should not underestimate the Christian need to evangelize, to spread the word of God and share the good news of Jesus with all peoples of the earth in order to bring on the end time. Preaching to Amerindians was fraught with danger, as you mentioned. The Iroquois did not take nicely to the Jesuit door-knocking and often mocked and mistreated these evangelists. The Canadian martyrs, and they're known as the Canadian martyrs, were eight Jesuit missionaries ritually tortured and killed during the warfare between the Iroquois, particularly the Mohawk people, and the Huron. These priests were subsequently venerated as martyrs by the Catholic Church and canonized by Pope Pius XI in 1930. Shrines have been erected, churches and schools dedicated, and municipalities named after the Canadian martyrs. When growing up in French Catholic Quebec, I was taught stories of the bravery exemplified by these holy men, with one in particular standing out, Father Jean de Brébeuf, who died a violent death in what is now southern Ontario in 1649. In 1940, he was proclaimed one of the patron saints of Canada by Pope Pius XII, and in 1984, Pope John Paul II prayed over Brebeuf's skull before joining in an outdoor ecumenical service on the grounds of the nearby Martyr Shrine. The service mixed pre-Christian First Nation ritual with Catholic liturgy and was attended by an estimated 75,000 people. The Jesuit priests were not universally trusted. Many Amerindians considered them to be malevolent shamans who brought death and disease wherever they traveled. On the other hand, the Huron sorcerer or shaman in the movie is jealous of the priest's influence over the Algonquins and is as arrogant, adamant, and unflinching in his beliefs as the Jesuit priest. Both men use their faith, supposed secret knowledge, and spiritual connections as power to frighten, influence, and ultimately rule other humans. The huge difference between the two faiths is that only Christianity has an evangelical mission that has been a powerful catalyst through the common era for much good, bad, positive, and negative brought to the world. 
Native beliefs resemble Judaism, for example, which has no evangelical element. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve, but it seems to me that Jews, like Amerindians, are born into their faith and feel no need to convince others to convert and join their faith. That's an interesting question. That's kind of where Judaism has evolved to, to this point, and it's probably way outside of the scope of this uh, particular episode. But in earlier times, probably about the times of what's called the Second Temple Judaism, going into the early part of the Common Era, Judaism was much more of a proselytizing religion. But as you said, now over the course of centuries, it's evolved more into the religion of a people. But even at that point in the Second Temple, there were Jews who believed that you were born into Judaism, and it was a religion of a people. But definitely, um, that's common amongst religions around the world, is that your religion is inextricably tied up with your culture and your nation or tribe, where it's not so um, internationalized as Christianity and, say, Islam are. I would like to get your reaction, Steve, on this comment from the director, and I quote, I think that even if you have no religious faith whatsoever, or even if you despise the Jesuits, you would still find it an interesting story. It's a wonderful story of obsession and love, and it is a wonderful adventure of the spirit and of the body. What those people did going to a country where winters were far more severe than anything they had known in Europe meeting people who were far more fierce than anyone they had ever encountered, having to deal with these people showing us something of humanity at its greatest. It's the equivalent of today's people getting into space shuttles and going off into space. It takes unbelievable courage to do this. Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that no matter what you think about Jesuits or that whole enterprise, especially the French, there was no guarantee that their colony was going to last. I mean, like you said, they were on other people's land who in many cases they were enemies with. Uh, They had allied with some Native Americans. They were enemies with others. They had other European enemies as well that were settling colonies in that area. The harshness of the land It bred a certain toughness in the Native Americans and just that adventure that they had going through these the beaver trails. Trail isn't exactly the right word I'm thinking of, but I think they said right up front, I think it was even Samuel de Champlain who said, you're going to be rowing 12 hours a day. And I can't imagine that a young Jesuit was in anywhere near the physical condition required of the adventure that he was taking. As mentioned, the culture clash in Black Robe is dramatic and cannot be underestimated. One key scene has an Algonquin asking another tribesman, Are these foreigners intelligent? The answer given was a terse and categorical no. To me, Steve, this scene was telling. A lot has been said about European negative evaluations and impressions of Native Americans, but the same can be said in reverse. In many ways, I'm sure Amerindians at the time felt morally superior to these foreigners, despite their technological advances. It was European advantages in technology, the unwitting transmission of diseases, and eventually sheer superiority in numbers that would overwhelm these native societies. The natives quickly became dependent on European manufactured goods, products, and weapons. This ominous fact is alluded to in the movie by the main Huron protagonist, brilliantly played by the award-winning Canadian actor August Schellenberg, as you mentioned. Initially, Europeans, especially the French, sought to trade, not conquer. But as the fur trade moved further west and slowly diminished in importance, land cultivation took hold. Europeans displaced the First Nations. As mentioned, native North Americans were technologically wanting, and this put them at a great disadvantage when faced with invaders that were at first technologically superior and later numerically superior. Yeah, I think that that's the really interesting part is with them going through these different areas and running up against the different groups. So I believe was the group that was Black Robe's guide to get him to the Huron villages. Were they the Algonquins? Yes, they were. 
So they had their own unique culture. I think that was one of the great things that they displayed in this movie is they weren't just all generic central casting Indians like in, um, I'm using air quotes here, like they had maybe would have done in a John Wayne Western 50 years ago. It seemed to take a lot of time to show the really distinct aspects of each of their cultures. Native peoples in these films were shown as living harmoniously and peacefully until the inevitable encroachment of the violent white army and settlers who were the harmful disruptive influence on Amerindian culture and landscape. These representations were far from the days of whitewashing in pre-60s traditional depictions of Native peoples, where white actors, as you mentioned in the old John Wayne movies, were cast for roles not meant for them. When instead of hiring someone that fit the intended race or ethnicity of a character, a white person was traditionally given that role. Old Hollywood whitewashing had a two-pronged effect, for not only did it impede Native American representation in film, but it also forced them into stereotypical roles. Some believe, however, that the pendulum has swung from one extreme to the other and that nowadays a simplistic one-dimensional depiction of both cultures has returned to the big screen but in a totally opposite way or reverse manner. Some feel Amerindians are now often depicted as flawless and virtuous victims while Euro-Americans are portrayed as cardboard villains. I believe that both extremes of the spectrum, gamut or pendulum, are simplistic, immature, unsophisticated, false, childish, and ultimately boring. Two mm -hmm. wrongs don't make a right. I found that the truth usually lies in the middle. All human history is awash in gray. Simple-minded, bipolar interpretations and presentations are a waste of time. All peoples and cultures should be portrayed in the arts as they appear in the real world multifaceted complex beings. In other words, the good, the bad, the positive, the negative, the culture, the cruelty, the beauty, the brutality, the sophistication, and the savagery. And I think Black Robe does a good job in doing this. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you enjoyed the listen. 